kind of scary and uncomfortable. Um, and then I compare that to now, where there's still some of that going on. Um, but these days, it's much more likely that the sidewalk or the bike lane is going to be impeded by someone living there. Um, or or debris that somebody else has dumped in our curb site community because they have decided this is a place of people who aren't valued, so we can dump our light there. Um, and it's really just striking to be like, wow, we had all this building two years ago. It hasn't actually solved the problem. In fact, the homeless count numbers will be coming out in a few months, but we, we think that if anybody with eyes can see this, that the problem of people being in the house just grown a bit in the last few years. So how do we tie this all together? Matthew touched on it, which is really, there's a lot of, um, the, the biggest problem, of course, is the fact that we have people who have to use the streets as their primary residence. That's the number one just issue. It doesn't matter that it's impeding on the bike lanes. It doesn't matter that it looks dirty. The problem is this is an inhumane situation that we have to fix. And everything else has to come after that, in my opinion. Um, however, all of what I'm talking about or even just the fact that when I bike at Temescal, which is a very thoughtfully designed buffer bike lane situation, because of the dining sheds that are there, that weren't there a couple years ago, it's actually a pretty fraught ride sometimes. Um, people like darting out behind the dining sheds. But all of this is a failure of uncoordinated planning and misplaced priorities within our public sphere and where we're at the game. So let's start with getting people indoors, and then let's see how can we plan for a healthier community for everybody. I have a lot more to say, but I'll leave it there and pass it on. Um, so, to say, uh, first of all, I have to find it. I think I'm going to say a lot of two wishes. Go for some jokes here, but I love my last two bar. Right, we'll stop. And uh, I remember there's more than one of them. So, um, so I'll do this extemporaneously. But um, so, my research in, in sort of professional interest as well as my relationship to the market. And um, there are some obvious relationships that we just heard about uh, right now. But, but I, I'll, I guess I'll go even more obvious and talk about the, the, the sort of relationships between cycling and, and housing. And it will come as no surprise to hear that the research out there that talks about and study the influence of the built environment on travel patterns, looks at sort of how the array of services and housing and so on affects people's travel patterns tends to support the idea that what really matters for alternative modes of all kinds, cycling, walking, transit, uh, public transportation, is proximity. Um, uh, and so there's a lot of focus, we've heard a lot so sure about building more housing in transit or building housing more density, that sort of thing. Um, it's worth noting a couple of things about this relationship. Um, one of them is that the, there's another important thing happening in the built environment that affects how housing affects uh, transportation and vice versa. Uh, and, and that is the extent to which it's also difficult to do other things. But in particular, the extent to which is more difficult to drive can influence the effect of the built environment on travel. If you can cycle somewhere in five minutes, but you can, you can uh, drive there in one minute and you can park for free there, uh, it doesn't matter if you can cycle there in five minutes. Most people are choose to try under those circumstances. And so a lot of what we see in the terms of the built environment density and housing placement really has to do with the correlation of the placement of housing and density of housing with traffic conditions that are more difficult and also infrastructure that's available for alternative modes. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. And another one to keep in mind that we should always um, think about when we talk about housing and transportation is that when people think about housing, and travel, we're often thinking about a commute trip. Uh, and the reason for that is that the commute trip is seen as it is, in fact, a really important. Um, it's my phone in the directions right now. Uh, I don't know. Here. I'll turn it on. What was I saying? Something. Something. Commute trips. Commute trips. Um, so so it's, it's, it is important to look at housing sort of housing jobs balance. People talk about wanting to issue just more housing near jobs, and that's true. Um, but it's also true that about 85% of people trips are not for work. They are for other things. And those other things are you know, all kinds of non-work activities, including shopping and visiting people and dropping their kids off and picking them up, those sorts of things. And so a lot of what we're talking about when we talk about housing concentration isn't necessarily 
housing concentration near the primary job, but also the availability of shops and services and other activities nearby, parks, you know, you need them. Something to keep in mind when we talk later about the consequences of different sorts of policies and how they might actually influence uh, people's travel choices. Cycling is just one of the many travel choices. It is a relatively small share of ultra level trips. Um, and so we have to be thinking, of course, when we think about cycling, we need to be thinking more in terms of intermodal uh, options uh, that are something other than driving. Thank you so much for um, Thank you all for that, all of the stellar answers. Um, you know, one of the things Matthew had mentioned early on, each of you have kind of touched on where I think we're about to go, so I'm very excited. Uh, I want to ask a kind of obvious but but backwards question, which is why is it that if, if for the four of us and perhaps for many of us in the audience, that these things kind of should just go together? Why is it that we don't typically talk about bicycle mobility to your point, just back and like transportation with housing generally? Can you each kind of speak to that again and then pass it back to you because I think you're gonna have to start us off the right way? Absolutely. <laughs> Um, why aren't transportation and housing more closely related? Well, I mean, when we when we talk about them, especially from the planning standpoint, from the policy. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I think they increase as you are, and they have been for a long time. So to some extent, they reach the choir of people in the audience who are thinking about these things all the time. So they are they are connected to the extent that they're that they're unconnected. I mean, there's that's a sort of a hard question. There's a long history of a sort of an engineering approach to trying to provide infrastructure that is focused on mobility. And takes for granted the idea that there is there are things to get to, and we're just trying to get people to get to those things. Mm -hmm. Hasn't thought historically necessarily about the ways in which the provision of infrastructure then causes changes in land use. So that's one big missing thing. Um, the second thing that I think we need to kind of acknowledge here is that um, driving and the auto uh, is an incredibly amazing and beneficial technology. And I like to say that because I'm here for the cycling. <laughs> so it makes sense. And I say this as a person who does the bicycle himself, um, but it's true. And it has enabled a disjunction of transportation and housing. We can afford to have a disjunction of transportation and housing precisely because we have the technology of auto. Now, there are consequences to this. There are all kinds of externalities of auto abuse and all kinds of consequences for the spatial arrangement of everything else that have fallen on that. But, uh, that's a great answer. Thank you. Am I next? Yeah. Okay. Sure. I, I hope we're going to have to everybody answer Jason, but that's perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> I mean, I can. I, I, no, no, I don't hear you guys. I hope it's okay to throw that to you, but it wouldn't be right, Mr. Moderator. Um, so I, well, I'm going to agree with Dan on one point that at least in the affordable housing industry where I spend a lot of my time with folks who are nonprofit housing developers or folks who work with government to facilitate affordable housing, um, transportation and housing are connected in the discourse, um, very much so. Um, there are you know, pots of funding to enable uh, the, the affordable housing and sustainable communities grant program, which specifically brings together transit-oriented development um, with affordable housing, where you can actually get more money to build an affordable housing project if it's, if it's near uh, transit. So transit-oriented development at this point is sort of accepted possible in the affordable housing development world. But the key word there is transit and housing are very connected. Active transportation and housing, I think, are not, maybe are connecting people's minds, but not in the sort of like professional discourse. And I'm I'm coming from, I this is the only panel of this summit that I'm, I'm joining this week, which I'm sorry to say, and that's partly because the statewide affordable housing conference was also this week in Sacramento and coming back for two days up there. And I can tell you, because I was paying attention, um, biking or walking did not mention once in any of the many, many sessions, right? Okay, but I'm going to chat. I mean, come on. Who's <laughs> really? <laughs> we can come out and have some talks. We can have some talks. Um, but, uh, but I mean, but you are true. You all did have one panel on housing, so I'm going to um, it's true. But yeah, I didn't hear, I didn't hear bikes being, being talked about at all um, in the many panels at that conference. Um, and here's what I'm going to say about that, which is that when I am talking to the folks that we work with, and work with a lot of affordable housing practitioners and professionals, we also work with people who have lived experience and currently live in subsidized affordable homes and organize with us. Um, they also never talk about bicycles for cycling. Like, I've, I've literally never, I don't have much to say, I've literally never taken part of a conversation about it. And I think it's because 
you are a low income person, you are so much more concerned about where you're going to find a place to sleep and how you're going to pay your bills than whether or not, like, as I know there's a lot of discourse, oh, bike lanes are gentrified in low income neighborhoods. I mean, that's a real discourse. It's not what I hear from folks. What I hear is the rent is too damn high. And again, everything else is secondary. And the last, and the last thing I'll say is that I think that for those who are doing grassroots organizing or advocacy on affordable housing, let's be real, this goes back to what I was saying before, I don't feel that the active transportation world has always been the most welcoming space, just to be real. And all of our, all of our fields can do better on welcoming people from the outside. But, you know, as a queer, mixed-race Black woman, I have not always felt that the biking community is where I want to spend my time. I think that's changing and evolving and working around this room, and I really appreciate that. Um, but it's not, your average grassroots tenant advocate probably has a picture in their head of who's going to come to a bike summit, which might be inaccurate, but I think it's also a barrier. So there's, those are a few things that I can share that I thought if we came down to. I'll, I'll touch base on that too. Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I'm so happy you mentioned that because when we were teaming up to even have this conversation, and when I was asking the panel, I was like, the people I think about who are at each of these meetings are very different. And sort of going further, I think that it is in some ways, especially in, in urban centers, the privilege to be able to bike and walk, and thus the, the intersection of race and socioeconomics makes it very difficult for the same person to be caring about both of those things. The second issue, again, is really the not that sort of privilege, is that a lot of the people, both working in the number of cities in the Bay and other cities across the state, the people who are concerned about bicycle safety and will show up to a meeting, will call the mayor's office, do, don't have a housing problem. <laughs> or, or, and to be more specific, they are, they are not experiencing the type of housing problem that you were describing. Um, or they do not feel it is their problem, even if it really is. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think there's, I want to come back to something you mentioned about the affordability of cars because um, not if you actually care about the cars. And I mean, and I mean that in a, in a sense, you know, and I'm not, I'm not even talking about people, I'm talking about governments. Mm -hmm. um, just, just here in the Bay Area, I know a few small a few years ago, the, the city of Morocco went virtually bankrupt because they ran out of money to, to, to rebuild the bridge and take the streets. This is a city where the median cost of the house is like 2.5. Mm -hmm. This is not a city without money. Okay. So but the, the point is that the, the way we pay for that infrastructure hides most of the cost to governments and to the people who rely on the car itself. I, I bring that up because when we get into the you know, fact something you were talking about, um, the same folks are showing up for these safety meetings and might actually have now a protected bike facility in their community. They're also living in a neighborhood, in most cases, with people who are most likely to drive their own car most of their trips. When you go into lower income communities, you actually see transit ridership go up significantly if there's big streets there. You also see more people riding bikes because guess what? Those people have significantly lower levels of car ownership. They can't afford it. And it's not a question of, oh, well, we can get a loan or what have you. It's like, no, I don't have five thousand dollars to buy a used junker that will get me to work. I just don't have it. So I need some other way to get around. And again, there's there's something that comes up, and, and, and this is actually a very loud conversation, a housing conversation, is about um, what are the mechanisms for more integrated, economically integrated, and racially integrated communities. So it's actually controversial because the, the literature is kind of all over the place about it a little bit. It's not clear what works. There's not like one answer to get to there. But the point is that that integration leads you to the promised land in so many ways because of the nature of how advocacy is going to work at the city level. So I can't, I, I struggle to envision a world where people who are struggling to make their rent, where people who are actually victims of traffic violence, which tends to be disproportionately in lower income communities of color, are they really going to have the time to show up to all these income communities? No, yeah, no, they're, they're not. Right now. But, but if they're living in mixed neighborhoods, where the people who do have the capacity are actually, frankly, it's one of our challenges is in those neighborhoods, unfortunately, they're too, too often unwilling to allow the type of housing to build. That's a huge problem we face everywhere, not just in California, all over the country. We've got to economically integrate our neighborhoods with housing, specifically with housing. Because then what happens is the people who don't have the capacity to show up, as they're focused on like much more urgent priorities, 
There are neighbors who do or can see the mutual benefit. And, and I gotta say, like, let's be real here. Even if they don't see mutual benefit, those benefits are gonna accrue to the whole neighborhood, right? And this is really critical because it's really hard to force people to say, I'm gonna be off your right? You can't legislate that. In fact, the tendency is, in general, for people to be self-interested, okay? So how do you take advantage of that self-interest in this context to help the benefits accrue to people who have been historically disempowered and disadvantaged and who will almost certainly never have a capacity to go and represent their own interests in these government hearings at 7 p.m. on a Thursday night at 2 p.m. On, on a Wednesday? It's like, it's not going to happen. Well, I, I want to stay on the subject of like, I'm like keep the spicy and hot words as much as we can. Well, seats like us. You know, we've kind of danced around the subject a bit about gentrification, right? And, and when we talk about high terms, we'll talk about high school infrastructure, we'll talk about bicycling at all. Or when we talk about housing, oftentimes, B&B, et cetera, which I do more, um, what, what should we do about it, right? Like, how do we address that intersection? These two subjects that often one finds a rabbit hole called is this gentrification? Where do you want to start? Oh, yeah. I yeah, I think it's, it's the conversation in Oakland and so many other places, right? How do we, how do we bring thriving communities? safety and amenities and businesses to, to communities that have lacked investment historically without those communities and feeling like the people who live there don't feel like they're welcome in their own homes or own good anymore. Um, right? It's it's the fundamental question of one of the fundamental questions for community development, which we have not solved. We have absolutely not solved that. Um, and I, I think I guess for me what I would say is I'm not gonna speak to sort of the relationship between like infrastructure and gender because I don't know that much about that, and I know the research is kind of... Okay, excellent. Um, but so, I, I guess yeah. I'll go back to what I, to what I said before, which is, you know, the folks that we work with in East Oakland and West Oakland, um, they're very clear that... Like, they, they are very passionate about, about gentrification and its related phenomenon, displacement. They're very passionate about not getting displaced. Um, and I also want to push back against the notion, I think a lot of times people say, oh, Oakland's over, everyone's been displaced. Actually, not, not true at all. What happens instead is people just, you know, they just double up. They do what they can to stay. When people leave, but then people also do whatever they can to stay um, in on very overcrowded housing conditions, um, which is why when you're in East Oakland, it's impossible to find a place to park, even though it's all single family homes. A lot of it single family homes because there are three families living in a home. Um, and you know that that's that's a consequence of gentrification. But at the at the end of the day, I think if we can build more authentic relationships between advocates and between community groups and with government. I think for people who are living this day to day, it is not an abstract or ideological debate about gentrification where it so often is in rooms like this. Again, people are like, can I pay my rent? Am I going to get run over if I cross the street? Am I going to get shot if I look at someone the wrong way? Like, those are the questions that people need to be able to have answered in a way that makes them feel loved and safe and belonging. It's not about this like abstract concept of, of gentrification. And so I think if we are working holistically towards neighborhoods that happen to be both safer to live in and safer to bike in, um, then I think we can maybe push past some of the ideology and get to what we're really working towards. And before we pass it to Dan, I'm just going to mark a point that you just said with a pin, that holistic planning. So let's, we're going to come back yeah, to that. Yes. Our, <laughs> yeah, come back. Go ahead. Um, I, so um, in defense of abstraction, um, <laughs> Please, Professor. Actually, no, I, I don't need to go there, but I, I just wanted to say that. Um, um, no, I mean, I think you made a, a good distinction that we need to, to um, emphasize, which is the distinction between gentrification and displacement. And so, um, and also the distinction between people being served by and having their needs met by infrastructure developments or planning efforts uh, versus actually, you know, 
being negatively impacted by them by them causing displacement. So there is virtually no evidence that things like bike lanes have any impact on property values. And there's been plenty of people out there who've hoped that they did and studied, the, studied them in hopes that you would show that there was a public value being placed on such infrastructures so that would justify more such investment. Now, you can look at this two ways. One of them is, oh, it's a bummer that you don't find such a relationship. And the other one is, well, it's good because it means that it won't contribute to uh, rising rents, which can then contribute to displacement pressure. Um, so I'll just say two things about this gentrification, gentrification and displacement. The first one is gentrification can happen without displacement happening. And let's, for all, for all we can do, can we, can we do that? How do we do that? And the answer to that is it's a regional problem. It is a regional housing supply problem. And we think about planning a lot of the times, I see coming from a planning department, we think about planning as a kind of a local neighborhood level, even parcel level exercise. And it is, but when it comes to dealing with the issue of housing affordability, it's completely insufficient to think about housing supply as even only being located near transit. That's one reason why the notion of transit-oriented development is deeply problematic, because transit-oriented development implies that housing supply should be focused in certain places, and it probably shouldn't. It probably should be more broadly applied everywhere, including in Marin County and, <laughs> and in other places, uh, Beverly Hills and Santa Monica. And, and well, Santa Monica has done a slightly better job. So, so there are um, larger issues at play here that have to do with the more general provision of housing that needs to be the supply of housing and, and the, the land available for housing needs to be opened up more broadly. And we're starting to do that in California, but we, you know, we have this SB9, which has made it so that you can actually develop two or actually four units of housing on any single family zoned parcel in the state. Uh, that could have some impacts, but on the other hand, the likelihood of individual parcels that are already developed being more intensively developed is going to be limited. And so we have a much larger issue. How does this affect bicycling? How does this affect transportation? In general, the relaxation of controls that try to dampen the supply of housing or that try to stop housing from being developed are ubiquitous. And to the extent that they could be relaxed more generally, you would tend to have more clustering of housing and more ability for people to use alternative modes because the fact is the market tends to want more density. It tends to be, there tend to be certain places that people want to live and there's more housing demand in those areas than is typically meant by supply. I come from Berkeley. Berkeley is an example of this. And Berkeley has in recent years done a bit more to try to increase housing supply. And it's been opposed by a lot of people on the council and the mayor, and then the mayor somehow turned that around. I'm not exactly sure what happened there. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, so uh, so the, the question is, what would happen in, this, in a world where we had a more general relaxation on housing? And I think we would have, we might have some gentrification happening, but we'd have a lot less displacement happening. Um, and that's all I need to say about that, right? That's enough. Okay, perfect. I, I wanted to. So I want to build off what Dan said in, in this point that gentrification and displacement are two different things, because displacement is people actually having to leave their community and go somewhere else, right? Gentrification is not necessarily better or worse, but it is fundamentally feeling like you're not welcome in a community, feeling like the amenities that you live in the community and, and relied upon have been have been displaced. So, like it can be a business or a school or another like a, your daycare left the community or something like that. So, but they're, they're different things because displacement you measure and, and we're seeing it in places like San Francisco that has basically lost its entire black population. Well, did all those black people leave the Bay Area? No, they're in Antioch, <laughs> they're in Tracy, they're in Turlock, they're in East Oakland, yeah. right? So, th so the city kind of, and, and this is the point I wanna to get to about this importance of thinking in a bigger scope about planning, which really gets at the nut of this. The reason that happened is that San Francisco is not accountable for the housing it doesn't build. The region is. Those people don't, I mean, unfortunately, and this is something that is actually catastrophic for things like climate change, a lot of these people are being displaced to places like Texas. You want to talk about a problem. If you move from California to Texas, just in moving, you have tripled your carbon footprint. Just in that act alone, you have tripled your carbon footprint because California has such a low relative carbon footprint. But there's all kinds of other reasons you don't want to be displacing people out of state. And frankly, you don't really want to be displacing people 
at all. But we have a system of governance where the jurisdictions, municipalities, get to say, we are going to allow this many people to live here, and anyone else who shows up, that's not our problem. Well, guess whose problem it's become? It's become Oakland's problem that San Francisco hasn't built enough housing because people just go across the bridge. And then if Oakland is trying to keep up, did a pretty good job for a few years, but it still could do much more. Berkeley could do more. So Berkeley didn't do enough for a long time. So guess where those people get this place to? Well, they're in East Oakland. Oh, no. Now they're in Livermore. Oh, wait, no. Now they're in Tracy. Now they're in Stockton. Now they're in Fresno. This is what happens when you don't build enough housing and when you let cities determine 100 percent, especially if these cities have a history of exclusionary zoning, redlining, uh, down zoning. I think the thing that I like to say to people, particularly from L.A., the city of Los Angeles in 1965 was zoned for 10 million people, 10 million people, city of Los Angeles, not the county. Guess what the zoning is for L.A. today? Four million people. They, they eliminated housing potential for 6 million people in the city of Los Angeles. You don't think that had an impact on the rest of the cities in LA? You don't think that pushed people out to Riverside and San Bernardino and further for housing? Of course it did. But that was a decision the city made to say, you know what? And you hear this all the time from people who we refer to as NIMBYs. I think I'm allowed to use that word. We're full. Our city is full. Enough people live here. And I just have to say, like someone who really believes in cities as a like an emergent property of human evolution, the notion of a city ever being full, the notion of a city ever being done or complete is crap. It's crap. This is the mindset we're up against with some of these things. And you have these governing bodies that, that overrepresent the views of people who think their city is full. And so if you zoom out and think about, well, what do you do about that? Taking a more regional view, you use the word holistic, and thinking, okay, this is a coherent region. How do we make sure we plan for the people who live in the region? Not because they live in San Francisco and, oh, the hate is this quaint little, like, guess what the hate used to be? You know, it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> not anymore. So, so we have to, I mean, there's this, there's this thing where, that is underway. There are regional governing bodies that are trying to do this. They still struggle. It's not like it's perfect. But the notion of sort of zooming further away, the state has a huge role to play in this. And frankly, the state and what we focus on in California Yimby is really giving the state more tools to help regions plan for more housing and we're moving and increasingly transportation. Because what we've learned is that at the city level, you get these parochial interests that can take over the city government and cause huge problems for the whole region. And there's just no pathway I can imagine where sticking to that model is gonna get you the solutions you want, whether it's on biking and active mobility or whether it's on living near transit or to Dan's point, the fact that most trips aren't to work. People go to grocery stores, they go to daycare, they drop the kids off at their friend's place. If you're one mile from all those things, you're gonna make a very different set of choices every day when you walk to your house than if all those things are 15 miles away. And that's the key is we can actually think about ways. It's not just about densifying Oakland and densifying Berkeley and densifying San Francisco. It's about creating more amenities in these outer line communities, creating more reasons to draw people to those so that they can do all the things they need within a mile or two miles. And that's really, I think, what we're focused on collectively. I mean, we all have our different approaches to how we wanna get there, but we've gotta take this bigger picture view of where the houses go and it can't just be next to the train. It's gotta be next to all the other things and that you get the agglomeration effect from people living close to each other. So just that, that agglomeration effect, by the way, one of those agglomeration effects is simply when there's enough housing, there create this creates a market for local services. Yeah. Right. When those local services are local, then you can have travel that is not not by car or, or at least shorter. I mean, we would get, by the way, much farther, we'd have much be much closer to our climate goals if people just drove less. We don't have to. So again, I'm at a bicycling conference. Modal shifts are yes. really hard, uh, but carpooling is an amazing thing in comparison to driving alone. And driving shorter trips is also amazing in comparison to driving longer. Dan, it sounds like you're trying to convince everyone to drive. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm, I'm not. I'm not. That, that's what I'm hearing. It's okay. Um, I, I think that we've touched a bit on the holistic part, and I, I want to stay with that. But instead of just talking about holistic planning from a from a government standpoint or from a state and regionalist standpoint, I, I want to circle back to the people, right? Like, how are we? Literally, the four of us, but also. 25, 30 of us going to have these holistic conversations with each other. What, what does that look like, right? Like, how do you start that conversation? And I'll, I will also preface as we lean towards the end of this discussion is how do we empower you all to share this, these kinds of conversations with your friends and indoctrinate others into caring about housing and transportation like I do? You want to start? Yeah, Gloria is always the best. Sure, uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, and I, I will also just just tag on a little bit to what Dan said. I'm also not I'm also not on the secret pro driving agenda, <laughs> but I, I I will I will just say that um, you know this is this is a pretty urban focused conversation that we're having right here. Um, and one time I earlier today I did actually in a housing meeting hear someone bring up uh, what they termed active transportation. It was someone who works in the San Joaquin Valley, and she was like, "Look, it's just not." Like biking and walking are just not an option where, where we are, which, you know, you could debate that or, or not. I'm not in a place to debate it. But, you know, she was like, we just need to get people living closer to, to their jobs. Right. That's like step step one. So I just let's also just be conscious that wherever we are, that the context is going to be very locally, locally specific, um, but all driven by the really messed up regional dynamics that, that Matthew was pointing out. It's still San Francisco's fault. No matter. It's, OK, sure. No, yeah, it's, it all, it's, it's all, if there's a problem, it's San Francisco's fault. That's if you thing. if you have one takeaway from this conversation, let it be hey. Matthew's point that it is San Francisco's hey, fault. I, I like that one. I'm gonna I'm gonna take I'm gonna take the controversy a step further though. I'm gonna say it's all white supremacy and capitalism's fault, actually. Yes. Which you know, San Francisco's fault. Is it the same thing? I don't know. <laughs> I'm kidding. I actually love San Francisco. I do. I do. I do. Um, but anyway, so where was I going with that? Um, holistic conversation. Holistic conversation. Thank you. I, I really think the way to have the holistic conversation is just to have the holistic conversation. Like, I think there's, so we're all going to specialize in the thing that is our job or the thing that is our passion. That is normal and that is correct. Um, someone who is spending their time working on bike policy should not be trying to get up to speed on all of the weeds of all the all you know of SB nine for example, um, it, it, that that's okay, and and I don't need to get up to speed on you know whatever it is that you all are talking about. All protected, this year. protected by claims are a big deal lanes. right now. <laughs> However, I do think we need to all start with the mindset because I see this in every sector that I'm in that we all think our sector is the most important one and everything else flows from that, right? And I mean, in housing, it happens to be true. No, but. <laughs> Of, uh, sorry, not sorry. But You're not I, sorry. No, no. Um, but but I think I do think we need to remind ourselves that just okay, we're obsessed. We're obsessed with biking. We're obsessed with walking. We're obsessed with buses. Whatever it is, that's fine. And let's just remember there are other perspectives out there that we need to be we need to be channeling. And then I would also just say it's a plug, but it's also a concrete thing you can do. Check out our website, ebho.org, eastbayhousingorganizations.org. You can sign up for our email list. You can get our emails about the actions we're doing in Oakland and beyond. You can send a letter to a city council member. It's really easy. Um, just every once in a while, step out of your comfort zone and advocate on something else. Doesn't mean you have to do it full time, but every voice matters. Do you want to plug Yimby as well? CAMB.org. <laughs> Join. No, I mean, I think, I, th I think, um, uh, obviously, we all have our specialization, and there's no way to expect everybody to be experts. But the thing that I'm very excited about that is happening, um, there is a convergence going on around these. Uh, I, I want to call them urban issues, but it's not just about, I think people think, assume when you say urban issues, you mean Los Angeles or San Francisco. Um, there are a lot of other cities in California. Um, most of them actually aren't even on the coast. Um, and, and it's important to do a reminder of that. Fresno is a big city. Uh, uh, Riverside is a big city. Um, these, are, these are places that uh, we don't think about necessarily, or at least 
for a lot of folks don't come to top of mind. And they're incredibly impacted by rising housing costs. Actually, impacted people by don't think that the highest rate since Rep Fesno, Stockton, crazy rent increases. Sorry, but just no, no. I mean, just that. to this point, you know, you could buy a house in Fresno ten years ago for like two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Now, like the median is seven hundred thousand bucks in Fresno. It's insane. But but why 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 why? Because the <laughs> Bay Area. <laughs> Actually, not that far off. No. But but the thing is, is you know, look at just look at that distance. That's a forced distance. That is a policy choice that people made. And the convergence that's happening is at both ends. It's people recognizing in Fresno, this isn't working for us. It's people recognizing in the Bay Area, this isn't working for us either. And the systems that are in place, I do have to say, like, I don't want to get into a discourse about capitalism because that's for me and Dave to do over beers at the bar over here. <laughs> but but the, the problem is there are legacy systems that we are in fact fighting. The development of highways in this country was catastrophic. I mean, we know the history here, right? This was not done. This was not a peace and love. Oh, everybody's going to be able to drive everywhere kind of situation. It was forced through communities and we know which communities it was forced through. The decision to go largely suburban, it was a policy choice. That wasn't what people naturally decided to do. It was a policy choice by the government to subsidize a certain type of housing, to encourage that type of housing, to give bank loans, a certain type of a lifestyle. So we do have like, you know, 75 years of unfortunate decisions about housing and transportation that we're up against. But that's not to say that the next 75 years have to look the same. And what's happening with the transportation folks, the safe streets folks, the bicycle folks, the people who just work in transportation on trains and buses and bus lanes, and the housing people, affordable housers, people doing statewide policy, we actually are finding each other and we're having these conversations and thinking about like, what is the solution to these problems. Because guess what? I'm going to double down on something she said. I think housing is actually pretty central to all this because everything else you do is determined, <laughs> is determined by where you put the housing. The house is a physical thing that once it's there, everything else is decided after that. So we have to make sure that the decision about where we put the house is in the right place, not just for the people who need the house, but thinking about like, what is our collective vision for the kind of society we wanna live in? What is our collective vision for how we correct the wrongs of the past, which are awful. I think most of us know the history of, of this stuff. If you don't, like there's books and books and we'll, we'll send you book rest. <laughs> I, have, I have to say the past and the present. Past and the present, it's ongoing. It has, we haven't stopped it yet. That's a totally fair and accurate point, I agree. But, but the convergence, I, I wanna encourage people to find places of convergence because they're with your colleagues, they're with our organizations. We're doing, this is happening. I mean, my boss is talking to Dave all the time and this is something that, that you know, didn't happen five years ago. So that, that the housing advocate talking to the bike advocate and then there's the transit advocates. Like we just need to do that more. How can we support each other? What are, in our case, what bills can we sign on to together that show a bigger coalition behind these reforms? And as that coalition gets bigger, the vision, the scale of the possible vision gets significantly bigger. We can actually correct a lot of this stuff. I agree that we don't wanna talk about bike lanes in, in Fresno, but that's just today. I think the Fresno of 10 years from now is gonna be a very different conversation if we're effective as advocates, so. Yeah, I don't want to follow that. <laughs> we were asking, we, we were um, being asked to answer a question about um, holistic approaches. And yeah, if you had any um, recommendations. So the one thing I would say is, is that what I try to talk about in, in my planning classes with my students is the necessity of taking a person focused approach and that we often take a, an issue focused approach instead because we come up with an, and the issue might be bikes, it might be housing, well, it can be whatever it is. Um, but that isn't necessarily responding to the needs of the person who is in front of us and what they articulate as being their needs. And so a participatory approach is always really helpful. And I think that tends to be more holistic in the sense that it tends to be about, uh, about people. Secondarily, I would say to this point that it has been brought up earlier, housing probably is really, really important 
for everybody. But part of the reason for that it is it because it has been systematically suppressed in so many places for so long, and that's why it's raising its head is such a big problem. There are other big things in our lives that also matter. Um, indoor plumbing, for example, but it isn't something. But indoor plumbing isn't something that's been systematically stopped from happening, and so we don't hear hear about that, right? So it's different things are important because of the history, and that's and so I would agree the housing is really important, and maybe that's the that could be the takeaway in addition to San Francisco is to blame for everything. Just to repeat Dan's point really quickly, if you leave here with anything, it is the combination that San Francisco is to blame. And second, and most importantly, just repeating back again, having these holistic conversations with your friends and your colleagues about the intersection of these issues, but most importantly, people's lived experiences and how they are navigating both figuratively and literally throughout the world. Um, I want to open it up for some questions. We have a couple of minutes, and I see a hand there, and then I'll go around the bend. Um, so uh, I think on the holistic note, on the intersection between people who think about mobility and housing, um, I, I actually personally, in my personal life, maybe I'm just in a liberal bubble, I feel like I've been really able to talk to people about housing and talk to people about mobility and those intersections. Where I feel like the messaging has really gotten to people in our spheres, but has not gotten to like, I would say the average person is when it comes to parking minimum reform. And I think I, I would love just your thoughts on like how we talk about that and how we can change that conversation. You know, I, I led a panel with professor of park, professor at parking of Michael Manville and Mott Smith with Senator Portantino, and it still didn't get to him. He still didn't get it. And so, and I'm still struggling to have these conversations in my own personal life. And I'm, and I'm just asking for you guys to, to give any wisdom or knowledge on this topic, because I think it's, it's vital. Thank you for supporting AB 1401, first of all. Um, one of the bills that California is working on this year that we uh, are renewing from last year is parking reform, um, which is, uh, and this is, I'm gonna assume people don't know this, but we actually mandate a huge amount of parking in this state. Just to give you a sense of the scale, the city, uh, the county of Los Angeles, 200 square miles of parking spaces. 200 square miles of parking spaces in LA County. Manhattan Island is 25 square miles. So when LA County says they don't have anywhere to put people who don't have homes, it's bullshit. They, have, they could house everyone in LA County who doesn't have a house. Guess how much parking they would have left over? 190 square miles. Okay, so this is fundamental misallocation of urban land. It is fundamentally stupid. It's also the law. We require people to build parking if they build anything. Oh, you're building a restaurant? Guess how much parking you need per square foot. If you build a thousand square foot restaurant in LA, you need something like 8,000 square feet of parking. That is not an exaggeration. So we're just forcing our cities to become parking lots by law. So we're taking a run <laughs> trying to fix that. I'm, I'm gonna get to your question. No, 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 please. <laughs> so the first step is to, is to give, and, and I know this, is, this sort of gets into a little bit of the capitalism debate, but I'm gonna stay away from that. <laughs> give developers the choice. Do they want to build parking or do they not want to build parking? Now, this is really important for affordable housing developers because a single parking spot in an apartment building can cost from forty dollars to $100,000 per space, depending on the location of the building or whether you're going down underground or going up over the ground. But each penny of that cost has to come out of the subsidies the developer has to build those subsidized units. So you're literally just shrinking the number of apartments that you can build for low-income people because you're mandating that you build parking for them. Guess what? Those are also the same people who are least likely to have or use a car every day. It's insane. It's insane. So that's one step is to actually try to take that. But I think to the point about how do you talk about it, where we've got a lot of traction is in two fronts. One is in addressing, you know, kind of bringing up the climate implications of forced car storage. Um, it only gets you so far, but there is a pretty large and passionate constituency in California for climate action. And by large, I mean like sways the legislature. It's a really important topic in Sacramento. They really care about it. Now, 
there's all, tons of ways to point out their hypocrisy on this, and I'm not, like, there's definitely room for improvement. But pointing out that um, that parking actually causes driving, and there's tons of research on this. You literally can evaporate driving behavior if you start to eliminate parking. It just goes away. It's like it doesn't happen. But the second piece is this affordability piece. You actually make it really, really hard to spread your housing subsidy dollars as far as you can and get the most homes for people if you require those apartments to have the maximum amount of parking. And that's that cuts a whole other way. And it's sort of counterintuitive. It's like, well, wait a second. But why does it because it costs $50,000 per parking space? That's why. And, and so if the unit costs you 250000 to borrow against or build, you've just, you know, five parking spots, five, 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 five parking spots, you've eliminated a home for somebody, right? So are you going to eliminate homes and do 200 square miles of parking? Or are you going to actually build more homes and let people park wherever they can if they need to? I'm just going to say 30 seconds on this because I want to get to the other questions. But um, I agree with everything you said. And... <laughs> And going back to Dan's point about being people-centered, I think when you're encountering really entrenched resistance, you've got to figure out what is really bugging people, right? We'll get down to them. And, and sometimes it's just like straight up like racism, xenophobia, ableism, whatever. And I, I have no patience for that. I'm not going to cater to that, obviously. However, um, affordable housing developers don't want to build parking because it's expensive. However, we cannot simply dismiss the fact that for a lot of people, including low-income people, sometimes driving is still their best way to get around. It's often not their car. A very un unrecognized mode is how do you get to work? Someone else's car. My cousin picks me up. My, you know, my granny picks me up, whatever it is. Um, and we do not, we as affordable housing folks actually do not get very far when we tell low-income people, you actually don't need to drive and you're the people who aren't supposed to drive. Like that's, right? So until, so again, going back to the holistic planning, until you can tell someone that they can get to their 5 a.m. Shif shift at the airport safely without driving in a metal shell until you have other alternatives for people, then we have to keep pushing for the parking reform 100%. We cannot be dismissive of those who are, for the right reasons, not quite there yet. So that's all I want to say. Going around the bend, so you were next. Um, so it's great to hear, you know, further discussion about the convergence amongst housing and transportation advocates, which is something I'm definitely all for. Um, I think there's a lot of similarities with both our succumb to nimbyism oftentimes and um, just general uh, gentrification discourse and things like that, um, more than you're trying to put a bike lane or add, you know, housing, certain types of housing. Um, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong or provide your opinion, that housing advocacy has been more effective in some ways than transportation advocacy in terms of building a larger, more collective movement in EMB. Um, but I might be wrong about this, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. See what are different tactics, different housing versus transportation advocates have taken, which have been effective, and kind of start that kind of discourse to see both how we can compare tactics and um, adopt more effective ones. I'll start and I will flag that because we only have four minutes. We have a hard stop at five. Your questions can be the last one, sorry. Um, I, I think that both have been successful or unsuccessful depending on what your metric is, right? Like, I think that we have some fantastic bikeways, for example, in neighborhoods that would kill me if I said I wanted to upzone them, right? Like, let's use Telegraph, which is just right here, right? Like it runs through one of the most expensive areas of the city and the bikeway is there and the housing isn't, right? Like, and at the same time, the only reason there's like a really, really tall building, you know, 100 feet off of Telegraph at the MacArthur BART station is because they have land use authority. So on one hand, I kind of like question that a little bit, but at the same time, I think that it also depends on politics, right? Like, I, I think it, and this is my statement to all of you, I think it is really critical who we vote for in the time that we vote for them, right? That, that there are council members who are very supportive of bikeway infrastructure who would never support upzoning their neighborhood, District 1 of Oakland. Um, and then at the same time, there are neighborhoods that are happy to welcome housing, but feel that bike lanes are gentrification, District 3. So um, I'm just naming off council members in Oakland. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you talking about? I don't know, because I'm a lot of now. <laughs> Do you guys want to add to that? Yeah. Uh, when, I, when I heard your question, the first thing I thought was, it's, exa it's exactly the opposite. Um, I think we have an 
arguably an oversupply of transportation infrastructure generally. Now, most of that is auto infrastructure. Um, we have a massive undersupply of housing in the coastal cities of the United States and in some other cities in the United States, a massive undersupply. The hundreds and hundreds of thousands of units in, in California, and this has been true for decades. So, uh, you know, I think the advocacy for housing is much harder because we're talking about a largely private market effort that is not controlled directly by the public sector, but it can be stopped. The public sector can stop it, but they can't make it happen. So that's a sort of a different world than the world of transportation, which is one in which we're largely publicly providing infrastructure. And so we have those decisions to make with public funds. So, um, but I couldn't, I, you know, as to actual advocacy tactics and so on, I'm not sure what I would say on that one. Yeah. Um, I, I think this is a huge technical minutia, but I want all of you to know this, that like the way that we make formulas for our tax dollars to be spent on things, and this kind of gets to your point, there are a ton of grants available for transportation projects. There are very few grants available for housing projects. Like the fact that Telegraph got, I think all said and done, maybe $20 million of funds just for that one street. We're talking about 14th street is $15 million, like just for these whole streets, right? But those are dollars that could have gone to housing affordability, right? Just for two streets. And don't get me wrong, I like both of them and I love those projects, but I do wanna flag that when we look at state budgets, for example, when we look at city budgets, for example, that those dollars, could be moved towards housing affordability. At least in theory, although it's the gas tax that's funding those gas so that's the issue. Yeah. Just, just to, oh, okay. so, so support no, Alex, support Alex Lee's social housing bill, please. We need to get back to building public housing in this state. I mean, that's among other things. But the thing I want to point out, and this is just provocative food for thought. I actually think that if you can get the housing right, you don't the, the bike and the transit stuff kind of forces itself into the market. Because, because, because the way people want to get around, like if it is really a super pain in the ass to drive a car, whether you take away the parking or not, they're going to start saying, you know what? It's a pain in the ass to drive this goddamn car. So food for thought. I mean, I am a cyclist, like I'm religious fanatic cyclist, although I'm injured at the moment. But so I, I'm not going to say don't build at bike lanes. Dave, please keep doing what you're doing. We're all, we're all, we're all in on it. But just think about, think about how much easier it could be if you put, if you help people live closer to where they want to live, which is indicated by these insane prices, and then what happens after that? So. I think we're stopping. Okay. Yeah. Five. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all for coming and have a great afternoon.